podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect to them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. This is your host, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Nick, what's up? How's it doing? Good, good. Hey, so with us today is Matt Calise. Matt is the um, pr- product director, of, director of product at Loon. He has a lot going on. What do you What do, you do Matt? You've got a lot going on. I was going to go through it, but why don't you just not <laughs> do it all up since this is our third take and I don't want to have it be our fourth. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, so yeah, I'm the director of product development at Loon Outdoors. I'm also their West Coast rep. Um, I'm the Southwest rep for Echo and Airflow, which is Rage F Sports, the West Coast or Southwest again, rep uh, for Scott Flyrods, Ross Reels, and Abel Reels as well. Wow. It's a lot to do, man. You get any fishing in? Do you sleep Wait, first? Do you, do you get <laughs> not, to sleep? not a lot of sleep. I do get okay. to fish, though. Okay. <laughs> so, Matt, when's the last time you went fishing? Um, It was probably about a week ago. Um, Where'd you go? Cat fishing, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. We were fishing channel cats in a ditch um, <laughs> behind my house. With um, uh, hot dogs? With hot dogs, absolutely. Um, <laughs> nice. They actually like the Vienna sausage uh, variation oh, a I little like bit that more. too. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, probably uh, last time I was on the lower stack. I have a three and a five-year-old, and uh, we pretty much, when mom goes to work, we just go fish. They can probably cast better than Chad, I'm guessing, already oh, yeah. at this point. Any, any toddler can, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I just check them these days. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> all joking aside, so you, you do live in Reading. Did you grow up in Reading? Um, I do live in Reading. Um, I did not grow up there. I am a transplant. Um, I probably moved up there in the early 2000s. I, I grew up in North County, San Diego, and... That was kind of, uh, we fished a lot of ditch pickles, you know, largemouth bass, saltwater fishing. Um, did you start conventionally or did you, were you right into the fly? Um, actually no. So, uh, I was five years old. My dad started off by, you know, taking me fishing as a little guy and, and, uh, it kind of grew from there. I didn't start fly fishing until I was about 10. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. That was about the same. Yeah. So did pops get you into it? Yeah. You know, uh. My dad bought me a like a thrift store glass Fenwick. Yeah, pretty much. It actually, I still have it. I think it's a lambing glass. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just a you know old glass rod and uh, a real basic old Martin click paw reel, which I s- still actually fish on occasion to these days, just for uh, nostalgia's sake. And uh, my my uncle really kind of uh, was a big fly fisherman, so he would bark orders at me and teach me how to cast and you know, randomly gave me materials like polar bear fur to learn how to tie with because it, <laughs> oh, was, it, it wasn't as uh, You could source polar bear. Can you still do that? Yeah, kind of. They sell that? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. It's still, I mean, there's, I think there's like five legal pelts in the U.S. or some weird number like that. Yeah. Um, well, but, that's interesting because we, uh, we we brought some elephant tusk in for you to tie later. Oh, that's, perfect. I mean, I'm kidding. We didn't bring elephant tusk. <laughs> Jeez. No, so yeah, I mean, it, it's been a pretty much a lifelong, fishing's just been a lifelong affair for me, so. Cool. Awesome. So how, what took you from San Diego up here to be a rep, or did you do something before um, the fly fishing industry? Yeah, so I did, uh, like, my EMTB, which is, like, the, you know, the guy who kind of, it's just the basic EMT. You don't have, like, all the cool MacGyver skills of, like, paramedics. <laughs> um, I did that down in San Diego, and... Um, I worked for a while in South Central LA, um, like Inglewood, Watts, Hawthorne, Compton, Whoa. Um, for a few years. And, Toughened uh, you up just a little bit? Just backing gunshot wounds, mostly, or? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, like you've seen Training Day. Like, oh, there's yeah. parts of LA that that's. And I know a doctor in the the ER down there, and it's it's like Iraq, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, you're shot in the leg and not bleeding too bad. You're gonna go sit in the waiting room for ten hours. Yeah. It's not a. It's, it's no joke. No joke down there. Um, so I started applying to like paramedic programs and uh, you know fire academies and stuff. And uh, obviously, population density in Southern California is much greater. Um, than up here in the state of Jefferson. So <laughs> <laughs> I got into school up here and I just kind of moved and never left. So that was how I ended up here. And then I did a lot of, you know, either it was a paramedic or fireman for the last like 13 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you'd, be, you'd go somewhere like up in Northern California somewhere and fish any local streams or lakes that you were working around or yeah i've been on fires and wet a line before yeah yeah I, I don't know if i you know would have admitted that like a long time ago but <laughs> you know there was definitely travel rod in the in the out of county we, we called them yeah. smoke jumpers that yeah. was the rod a little seven piece five okay. piece rod that we used to build out of the chico fly shop we'd make right we make smoke jumpers right yeah. they, they have to eat right yeah. <laughs> so matt we were you know we were talking before we started recording um you know you had the transition that you did from emt when you got into the uh into the the um yeah that thing rep side yeah that thing jeez <laughs> <laughs> to the rep side like what did you um how'd that come about yeah it was uh it was kind of funny i was i was i got on some pro staffs and uh through a rep and he's like yeah i'm gonna have you on this pro staff and and then the next thing i knew he was like i don't want to be a rep anymore my wife wants me to do this and it's like oh okay he's like but you should be a rep like you'll make a ton of money and I was like oh this sounds like a great idea and like at the time I was like this is gonna be rad I'm gonna have all these fly rods so I think I bought like 70 fly rods and you know reels and like I just spent like all of this money and uh the first few years you know I was doing that on my days off from being a fireman so you know you have or a paramedic whatever it's like you know you work 10 days a month you have 20 off and so my wife always jokes, she goes, everywhere we go, you go to a fly shop or you go fishing, why don't you just make money at it? Well, it wasn't really the reality. It took a while to, you know, gain the trust of what, you know, however many shops are in California, 25, 30 shops in California who are actually like trust you. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, I kind of got suckered into it. And I guess it's worked out for the better at this point, you know? Um, but in the beginning, my wife was pretty doubtful that it would ever be my main source of income. <laughs> so you've been, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. How many years is that? Uh, that was about eight years ago. Okay, wow. So, yeah. yeah and it, was, was Loon the first one that you started working for? No, so originally I worked for, I worked with like Beulah, I worked for Watermaster, uh, Rising Tools, which is actually a huge competitor of Loon, um, you know, as far as like accessories and stuff, um, and Nautilus fly reels. So, I had all these like kind of you know these cool brands and working on trying to get them out there and um, one day I kind of crossed paths with the loon people. Um, it wasn't like out of the blue or anything. Uh, one of the ladies that works there grew up five doors down from me in Encinitas, so it's like lifelong friend. I think I harassed her horribly as a child because she was a few years younger than me and like we were like the older boys so we'd like mm -hmm. squirt them with water guns or you know <laughs> stink bomb them or whatever you know evil things boys do I pulled to, that one yeah. yeah yeah you know just just evil boy pranks sure um and uh we kind of just connected and we started doing tying videos and just different weird stuff and all of a sudden it was like one day they're like so we want you to design all of our products and i'm like like you know they sent me like a proposal kind of a thing and i'm like okay and they're like, oh, yeah, but you can't be a rep anymore. Did you have design experience in any other field before you got approached for that? No, not at all. What a trip. Yeah. What was, do you, how do you, why do you think they made that decision? I mean, it's obviously a good one because you have four sips and other stuff on the <laughs> store now, but that's just such a random thing to have, have happen to somebody. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up doing like designing stuff my whole life. Yeah. Like uh, I call it, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's not engineering. My dad was like built underwater robotics. Oh wow! Okay. So I kind of you grew have up that background. Yeah, the technical background. Yeah, like you know when you go to dad's shop at the end of the day and like mom has to go do something and you're stuck someplace and you're in a giant fish tank driving like a two hundred thousand dollar ROV as a child. Like 
you know, in the in the in the early '90s, like Super Nintendo didn't seem that cool anymore. Yeah. Um, but you know, yeah, it was cool. I got to learn how to like machine stuff and yeah, how. So you got the industrial design stuff. Yeah. By osmosis, really. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Or you know, just yeah, pretty that much. Was cool. Yeah, it was really kind of a strange transition, but um, I just brought a lot of stuff over from my out of my brain that I was like, fly fishing needs this, this. Oh yeah, for fly so time, were, it's great. So were you first just kind of like giving them? suggestions on what sort of where the product direction should go and then eventually they said hey why don't you just design some stuff and stop bugging us was that how, kind of how it went down or yeah well yeah it was kind of interesting i mean uh there was a lot of like phone calls where it's like hey we're thinking about doing this and these are the options like what do you think's the better option and i was like oh this for this reason and that reason and, and then it kind of just led from that to do you want to work for us and you know, so I took that route. Yeah, the, I mean, these niche industries, there's not really, you know, an established career path to get into them. So it's really interesting to see how <laughs> you got into it, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, there's definitely not a college course that's yeah, like, you know, not. Fly, fly fishing product designer 101. It doesn't, no. you know, there's no uh, degree for that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's nobody taught me to be a chemical engineer. I read a bunch of books about it and figured out what's doing what inside of catalyzing reactions and why things happen and what this compound versus that compound would do inside of a formula. And, um, you know, I haven't really lit the house on fire yet and things <laughs> seem to be pretty popular as far as our UV resin. So, um, I feel like we've done pretty good. That's awesome. That's really yeah, cool. I, it makes I, sense just going from like that, knowing what a micrometer is, you know, all the way down to knowing what a hackle is or a slop and be able to just create, create flies, which yeah. you do. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you just got to look at stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's like you walk down an aisle at a store and you see something and you're like, how does that work? And then it's just inside of my head. It typically goes, oh, if you did this, this, and this to it, then that'd be a really cool fly tying product. Or you can manipulate that into this. Like, uh, like the forceps that you've lost mm -hmm. twice. <laughs> twice, twice, twice. <laughs> so when I worked as a paramedic and I'd have like, you know, the bad car accident patient, we have those cool trauma shears that cut through like pennies and all that stuff. Right. Well, I'd lose mine like every day. So the whole original, the original design for that, I saw some guy who had like MacGyvered a carabiner onto it, like randomly, like, and it was like a small one so he could clip it on his belt. So I took like a full industrial rock climbing. And we're talking about your rogue quick draw forceps, right? Yeah. 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 So like I get home and I'm like, you know, I got some fun toys in the garage that help me manipulate materials into what I want them to be. And so we cut all these pathways and I grind all this stuff and glue it all together. And now I've got these like carabiner cutters and I'm like, oh, cool. And then like I started working for Loon and I was like, oh, you guys make forceps. Oh, we need to do these, but like, you know, but as a forcep, that would just be the next thing. So it was, it was kind of weird. That's just the way my mind works. So. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. My only, the only thing that I would like is just, um, some sort of a GPS tracker on it. So if you do, you know, lose it, like I have, you could just bring <laughs> it up on your phone. That'd be one thing. The other thing is I have huge hands, huge hands. So, um, the, the part where the carabiner is built in right maybe a, just a half inch bigger that's it i oversized that like i feel you like still i have <laughs> you have already done that and like i was like okay so if a normal human had gloves on in the winter would they still fit yeah i guess i'm screwed yeah i'm sorry pretty much <laughs> yeah well um you know what what's it like working for loon and scott you know on on a day-to-day -day basis like what's a day in the life for you man it's uh it's really variable you know, I, I would say, you know, a lot of people ask me, they're like, oh man, how do you just sit there all day and like stare at a computer screen? And, um, but it's really not like that. You know, some mornings I'll be doing product design or working on a new, you know, chemical or doing 3D CAD engineering. Cause a lot of the stuff I've found uh, by modeling at first, I can, you know, prototype much quicker. Are you guys 3D printing and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have a print shop that does it in stainless steel now. So I can actually have Whoa. physical weights of the materials um, before they go even to like, you know, uh, to like prototype. Yeah, I just toured Edel Edelbrock facility because they make like, you know, carburetors and heads yeah. and stuff like that. And they have a huge CAD, CAD program and then all their printers and they are not using steel. 
yet, so that's pretty cool to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's really expensive. Like a pair of forged would probably be a few hundred dollars. You know, just to have a sample of something. Right, and right. You're like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, bummer. But it's still just so much cheaper than how, having to go back the old way. Right. Yeah, the yeah. back and forth. It saves. It's, yeah. it's more so saving time, which time at the wise, end of the yeah. 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 But time equals money at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of the days I, I wake up. You know, I used to ride my bike to work, but the uh, the three doors down at my house, like, you know, rooms, I should say, it just didn't really make sense. So I gave that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was trying to be healthy. You yeah. know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's a lot of shop conversations, talking with shops, figuring out uh, products that might fit a specific need for customers. Are you on the road or on the phone when you're talking to shops mostly? Because I know you, I mean, you were just in Fish First here in Chico today. Yeah, I've been in, I've been in two fly shops today already. Okay. So I probably... Probably put 600 miles on the car just today alone. Um, yeah, hands-free is pretty awesome. Most of the time I'm talking to shops in between shop appointments or, yeah, I'm everywhere. How many, on average, like how many miles a week are you driving typically? Um, it depends. I've never actually done it by week. I, I mean, it's over 20,000 a year. Okay, that's um, quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could drive way more, um, but uh, I have my little routes down, I guess, and all my places to hang out but yeah like you know you ask like at the end of the day do you get to fish places and it's yeah absolutely you know what's your favorite type of fishing as far as whether it's swinging or steel you can't say cat fishing because you already said that earlier. trout or darn darn uh, you were talking about high mountain lakes a little bit earlier it sounds like you have a little interest in that yeah i mean hands down my favorite thing is steelhead yeah like yeah it's ditto it's it's a I don't know. It's like an addiction. So like when I grew up in Southern California, we did a lot of swim bait fishing. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we're throwing like AC plugs and fishing saltwater rods and, um, you're looking for that one fish. So like fishing for a whole day and never touching a fish, like you're like, Oh, that's cool. I was kind of out here. So like when I transitioned up North and like really got the steelhead bug, the guys are like, how do you sit there all day? And I was like, how do you not like <laughs> that one fish? Like, you know, like, well, and, and that's more coastal steelheading too. Like right. mm. that, that's, you know, it's a whole different ball game, but, uh, yeah, that's probably my favorite, but I don't, I don't really, I don't frown upon any fishing. Um, if you will. Right. You know, I, I mean, I if like, there's a fish that bites. I want to try it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I, I love mousing. Like that's super yeah, fun. Yeah. Um, you can do that a lot of different places that even if you, I mean, that you would normally not throw a mouse. Right. I think you can and catch fish. And oh. I don't think a lot of people. Oh, think about, I, think I've been way. I've been on some few streams and I won't blow it up for those areas. Right. right. But like, you know, it's like, oh, we fish these size 38, like yeah. tiny <laughs> things. And I'm like, splat, mouse, squish, squish, squish. You know, like he's just swishing over everything. And all of a sudden it's just like, <laughs> it's like eruption. And guys are like. <laughs> like, you know, like they have like, not to, I'm not talking trash, but they have like their bamboo rod and it's like this like pure thing. Sure. And like, all, I, all of a sudden I come in with a flat brim hat and it's like making noise and I've like ruined the whole experience for them. And then they're probably pissed because I just landed like a four pound on a road brown on a rodent on a rodent. And they're like, <laughs> we did not see any rodents hashing this afternoon. This was horrible. <laughs> so is that the... Um, you obviously do a lot of time, which I want to talk a little bit about. You, you do the, the neat Loon Live series, which a lot of people <coughs> tune into and check out. Um, that's pretty awesome. How, how'd that kind of get started? And yeah, the, uh, the Loon Live series was, it was pretty funny. Um, we started with a company out of Oregon, which was really cool. It was called Your Brand Live. And they're, most of what they were doing, um, like GoPro uses them, mm-hmm. Corker's Boots uses them. Um, and it was to get customer interaction on a new product. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think like the early, I think when I came on board, they had done like a few, but it was like, this is top ride. <laughs> and you know, like it's like this like full jingle salesman type. Like, I mean, it wasn't bad, like, but there's just not much you can do with top ride. It's like, oh cool. It makes your fly float. It's like it's in a bottle. You put your fly in there and Um, so I like looked at that and I was like, what the heck was, what is this thing? What do you guys have? And they're like, oh, it's a live stream. Customers can like type in their questions. And I'm like, oh, we're tying flies on this. (laughs) And they're like, really? So like we got like the, uh, 
like, you know, the, the little webcam at the mm-hmm. time, it was like a webcam and, um, it's truly amazing to see where like things live, have gone, right? Like it's, oh, it's like, a huge, thing. it's almost like, this is our third year that we've been live streaming. And, you know, so we went from like this, like total archaic thing where we're like, okay, everybody tune in, here we go. And it's like super Praying ghetto. that it's going to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, I mean, it wasn't ghetto, but it was like, it wasn't like you were watching NBC sports on, you know, Saturday. Right. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of the progression. We just started putting it out there and, um, it was a little bit crazy in the beginning cause it was every Thursday night and it was two flies. So it was like everything in my box. I'm like, Oh wow. These were all experiments. Like, and I fished them and we've caught fish on I'm like, okay, we've got a time live. And, uh, so we, we switched to the first and third Thursday of every month. Oh, okay. Um, the, and, and it's, I mean, you know, we have to do bulk emails. We have to hit like, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, sure. like website work, links, back end. Kind of like this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like all this stuff that I don't understand. Like, you know, I tie flies and I take some pictures of them and then they go away and I push a button and it turns on. It's a little more complicated than that, but, um, you know, and then it streams to the whole world. And it's been pretty fun. No, it's super cool. I, and they go up into the cloud, too, so I can watch them after the fact. Now it's kind of a new option. Yeah. At least on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. It never used to be that way, but now it's recorded and you can actually yeah. go back and see it. Yeah, I think, uh, well, yeah, so we do Instagram Live as well um, as just to, like, hit a different target audience. Oh, okay, that doesn't go to the same no. platform? Ah, no, okay. no. Okay. So it's really kind of weird that way. Um, it's two separate entities. Um I always think of the the Instagrams kind of more raw and gritty. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's going to be like the fun thing where you like drop in on a riffle in the river and you're like Instagram live on Loon Channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like mm-hmm. dudes whack like four trout out of a run. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. that's how you catch trout, guys. Yeah. Click, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, the actual Loon Live broadcast, I mean, it's. It's a little bit more involved. The real deal, yeah. And yeah. you said you take uh, user questions on the air. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What's, it's. Uh, do you ever get people questioning your every move? Um, No. Every once in a while you get like, you get somebody who's going to be really like just inappropriate. <laughs> right. You know, like. That's what I was waiting for, yeah. You know, and it's Broadcast like. Broadcast spawners. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's super funny because you can just reach up and say. This person's never allowed here again. Just there's, block. Yeah, there's just like a black ball. Like instantly, like you scroll the mouse over, click, and you're gone. So um, yeah, it's it's been a fun project. So what flies you 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 obviously tie a lot. What's your what do you like to tie just on your spare time? So, sounds like steelhead flies, traditional um, swinging flies. Yeah, I really like traditional swing flies, um, like intruders and mm-hmm. you know low water stuff. Um, I never really follow patterns. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like whatever moves me at that moment. I'm like, oh, this would look cool. And like pile all these like 20 things on there. And right. Oh, hey, that looks pretty decent. Like, you know, we have a bag of goodies over there that we're going to have you uh, (coughs) put together just random, random materials. And you're going to have to tie some kind of fly off of what you got in front of you you down. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. I figured you'd be up to the challenge. We'll do that a little later. (laughs) <laughs> in the episode, right? Yeah. I've, I've done some iron fly work before. Yeah, we heard of, did that in Florida recently, I think. Is that where? Yeah, I got my butt kicked by a lady. Really? They did, like yeah. an iron, they, they did an Iron Chef kind of thing, right? Yeah. When it was in uh, Las Vegas, I won. Um, so I think I went into it a little bit cocky. And uh, one of our Loon ambassadors was sitting next to me. And uh, we weren't too serious. So we both got our butts kicked. Well, we have a non-traditional ingredient for you today. All right. That's fine. <laughs> what was the surprise ingredient? Oh, it was like a monkey stuffed animal or something. Oh. It was like really strange. <laughs> I might have to go sort through the trash or something because what I have isn't, <laughs> isn't as isn't, good. No. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Well, I had to figure it out. Yeah. We had Bob Clouser as a d- judge and I tried an articulated Clouser and I, I didn't get to the second round. That sounds cool. Articulated Clouser, I like it already. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. I figured Bob would like it. I mean, he invented Clousers. <laughs> but uh, maybe I was playing too much to his heartstrings, you know? And he's like, you're out of here. Do you see 3D printing becoming a lot more um, a piece of the pie as far as fly tying goes? Um, Ooh, good one. It, You know, I, I'm sure it really could. I'm, I mean, it's, I think it's already here. 
Right. Um, but it just can be like in the more... home, like a guy's got a 3D printer on his desk. And he's like, oh, I want to I want to do a sculpin head. And here's what I want it to look like. Boom. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I haven't seen anything like that done. Uh, the avenues out there. I mean, to sell that, like Shapeways, stuff like mm-hmm. that, like some of these print houses. It's just a little too expensive so right now. No, it's, no? it's not. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, guys, you could say, oh, I want to, you know, 3D print a cell phone holder. It's like four bucks. Wow. Like you cu- send them the file and boom. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, actually, it. it's actually an interesting concept because on like some of those websites, it's actually like a store. So the designer gets a cut and then the, the print house gets a cut. Right. So it's like a, they're just like the middleman. It's e-commerce. Yeah. Coming to your yeah, front door. Yeah. I mean, I could see guys doing that. If they start printing in tungsten, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, but tungsten smelts a little bit hot, so uh, it might be a little tough. Hmm. I've been using a lot of tungsten lately. Getting down and dirty? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're not snagging, you're not bragging. right? I was snagging a lot this weekend. That's all right. <laughs> I I think a lot of people are really scared of weight. Yeah, it's it, it blows my mind. It's changed, it's changed my game in terms of the size of fish I'm catching. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's crazy. I have some uh, I have some really strange concepts for like uh, like on our you know like our main river the lower sack, um, just crazy amounts of weight and it's like, whoa, I just went behind ten boats and like we hooked a lot of fish was it very interesting so some hmm. interesting rigging and stuff like that yeah know? i've been thinking about that lately because he's turned me on to the check nymphing game and it's just kind of opened my mind i've always high sticked you know i love right. it um, it's just a different way to do it i guess and it just there's there's a lot of rigs that haven't been created yet that are out there Can be adapted you know? from check check yeah. style you know yeah. yeah oh absolutely absolutely um yeah, I mean, even even you know, high sticking or check nymphing the the big rivers. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah, I might want to leave that out of the podcast, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> ding ding. Yeah. No. I've, no. We're already talking about that. So, um, in turn, I, I want to talk about the when you guys are thinking about product, right? New product. Um, you know, from concept to actually bringing some of the market with. Typically, what's the life cycle? How long does it take? You know, it's re- that's a great question, and uh, it's so dependent on the product itself. Um, Let's talk about the forceps you're going to make with the bigger, the bigger hand inside. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, but how long? Like for you know something we we're, we know know about like your rogue quick draw forceps. How long did those take? Um, we those probably took, I mean, less than a year. Okay. And that was getting like, you know, sample, no, denied. Um, Because a lot of places that are willing to make stuff for, you know, like make forceps aren't like the most sophisticated. Um, So we had to find like the right guys to do that job. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have a great manufacturer right now that we work with. And, uh, you know, he pretty much nails stuff. So it's getting better. Um, Some stuff, I mean... It's like I literally drew it in CAD, printed it, printed it in steel, sent it out, and it came back like three weeks later. Wow. And you're like, oh, okay, that's done. Um, that'll be in our fall catalog. And you're like sitting there like tying with it, and you're like, oh, I can't use this on the live stream. I can't show guys this. <laughs> it's like we're, we're coming out with a new light right now. And um, obviously with the environmental side of things with Loon, batteries. You're like, oh, cool, I'm going through batteries, how do I do that? Mm. You know, we always recommend a rechargeable for people, like, or I do. Um, our new light's going to have a rechargeable battery, you know, plug it straight into a USB. USB, yeah. And yeah. you'll have, like, a 13-hour runtime. Damn. Cool. Very so, cool. And there's a cool... So double as a headlamp? Okay. No, I'm it kidding. doesn't. But if you wanted to go, like, hunt scorpions with a UV light in the <laughs> desert, you could probably see them, like, <laughs> a half cool. mile away. Which I like it. to do every other weekend, so yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a pretty common pastime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um you know so you've got the light coming up are there any other products in the lineup that you can talk about that and you know, you're excited about, about? <laughs> um it's top secret yeah yeah i mean well no we had so we had five new products launch this or that are launching right now um probably gonna be available in october so we did a uh i based everything 
uh, last year with our new tying tools like off ergonomics and comfort in the hand. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And everybody goes, man, why did you make everything yellow? I love your scissors, the scissors, by the way. Thanks. I just got them, started using them. Um, that's all I'm going to use. Nice. I like them. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, we made everything yellow because when you like throw it on the, see my desk doesn't, I saw a picture of your desk. I have, in, I have some Intel and I couldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't even. Can you critique it already or is that what you're going to? No, I just wouldn't even, I would, I'd, I'd feel like scared I'd, at there. I didn't want to make a mess. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, so, it, it's still new, man. I mean, I've, I've only got say $2,000 worth of material. No, I don't know how much I've spent. I got a good deal on my little starter kit, but I got it. I got it most of it used, but um, I'm st- now I'm adding stuff. Right. But yeah, everything's pristine right now, of course, but because it's all brand new, and I just like I like keeping things orderly. I was cracking up how you were like, I use a vacuum at my work at my workstation. Yeah. What, what do you use, Matt? You know that that question. And you have a vacuum, he <laughs> and said. And he's actually he's tried it before. Yeah. So now see. <laughs> well, I've tried it. He, he just got a little humbleitis there. <laughs> well, you know, I've tried everything, and uh, yeah, like my desk is just a train wreck. So the yellow tools just like always stood out. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you're just going for contrast, high contrast. High, on the, yeah. Yeah. Not only does it play to the brand, like it's a branding image yeah. look thing, um, but it's really actually is like it's like playing Where's Waldo. You know, half yeah. the time if you're looking for tools after yeah. tying forty flies, and uh, so it's like they they pop. And so we came out with a whip finisher and a bobbin threader, um, two tools that actually I don't use. At all. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we're going to make some tools that I don't even use. I saw the whip finisher. Pretty cool. It has a pretty fat handle, a little bit easier to hold on to. Yeah. And then on the back side, it's actually sharpened uh, to a point. So when you get done, you don't have to pick up your scissors. So you whip finish Ooh. and you'll just be able to pop Snap. your thread. Yeah. Um, well, that's out next month? Yeah. Okay. And then the bobbin threader is out at the same time? Pretty much. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, because your uh, your ergo bobbin, um, all my bobbin threaders are too short for it. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. I can't get the doesn't go down and all the way in there. Um, so don't bite on that. <laughs> I know you're you look. You're, I know, man. All right. I'm looking back. at you, Nick. I'll stay back. He was gonna make. Be focused. He was gonna make. Focus. It. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and then yeah, then we have three new lights coming out. So we replaced okay. all of our lights. All for the desk, yeah. Um, actually, one's a stream side light. Um, that's just like a little guy. Just a tie at the on the campsite, like, or no? Like if you're, uh, you know, using like not sense, because mm-hmm. we have that UV material. Mm-hmm. So, so say you like check nymphing. So yeah. we have UV fly paint, which is red, yellow, and orange. And that's the stuff in the little tiny the little powder, tube. yeah. No, no, no. It's not no. even a powder. It's actually okay. a premixed UV resin. Oh. So, like for my check nymphing application for that, I put it on as a cider. So I make a bead of red, UV, or orange, whatever color. Right on the line. Right on the line. Hmm. And then I'll cure it. So then I have this, like, killer little cider going through. And Hmm. I'll put, like, stacks of them, and I do it by depth so I can tell what depth I'm fishing. Oh, it's four foot from the bottom fly to the first one. Now I'm fishing six, eight, nine, ten feet. Damn. And they're small, so it passes through the guides when you're landing a fish should you need it. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. That's but if really you needed nice. to cure it, like say it's an over cl- overcast or cloudy day, you just break that little thing. You just out. take this oh. little light out and do your work, and you're done. Okay. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Just little I never trick thought stuff. to use UV resin as a cider material, and that's awesome. Right. Well, it, it takes you away from buying like special cider material. Yeah. Which I think there's only like two companies that make it, and somehow it's like Rio and somebody else. Yeah, it's like 15, 20 bucks for oh, cider. It's, it's a total the it's, highway robbery. It's a it. lot of money for some oh, yeah. pink fly line, you know, or fishing oh, yeah. line. Um, it works well though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's like my little walk around, like my little chitty pack for check nymphing with UV resin. Do you have a, a travel tying kit? Cause you just, you brought up, tr- you know, vice at home or tools at home. Do you, do you pack around a, like a soft kit that you use to when you go like camping gonna, or anything yeah, like, that, or? Stuff like that? Cause I'm it, looking it, at, it, I'm it, looking it, at my it. tackle box over there. I've, I've had that since the day I started tying flies and that has all my, you know, Threading and wires and right. Like, it's organized your, night. I like it. Yeah, you what's, know, your, but, what's your what's uh, your on the go travel um, kit look like? It's it's lots of plastic bags. That's what my, that's what mine is. Too. <laughs> like, well, a lot of times if I'm traveling and tying, I'm typically going to a shop to do a demo. Yeah. So you know, I'll collaborate with the shop owner. I'm like, hey, what am I what am I supposed to tie? Mm-hmm. And he's like, gives me this list of things for his area, and I'm like, okay. 
like there's no curve balls in there so I'll set up all of my materials hooks beads like everything dialed in in a bag so I pull out a bag and it says you know it's a freezer bag you write okay this is going to be an intruder this is going to be you know low water steelhead fly right. you know this is going to be trout nymph whatever it might be so it, so I guess my question's more like if you're going to you're going to go on a you're going to go fish with your buddies on a weekend like what is that what does that go bag look like for you is it the same sort of thing you know kind of like what ties yeah, it depends on where he's going and what tie and... tie. it's kind of where I'm at at my home at my house I have everything just in bags and I have like my hex fly stuff in one bag and then I've got you know my streamer stuff in another bag and I kind of just have it organized that way I don't yeah know. I just started tying like literally two weeks ago so I'm really curious on how organizationally and cognitively you guys think about I don't have stuff. two walk-in closets that with fly time materials I, I heard you know, Matt so. does <laughs> is that right yeah yeah it's it's pretty horrible um <laughs> you know uh so yeah like I, I don't know I don't if I'm going on a steelhead trip or a fishing trip like I have more bugs than uh right I probably know what to do with so most of my travel tying is for demo purposes. Okay. Um, but yeah, like at home, like you're using bags. Um, I use those one dollar shoe tubs, like the little plastic yeah. guys, yeah. and uh, like a P Touch label maker, like metal shelving. And you like walk in, it's like shimmy in there at this point now. Um, you use it. You have a label maker just for the bags. Well, I mean, everybody has a label maker. You just. Well, I guess not. Not everybody. I, you, and I do. <laughs> <laughs> the guy sitting to my left does not. He goes. I took plastic bags with me to Mexico with a vice, and I one night at the lodge, I sat down and I didn't have any shrimp patterns. Uh, all these crabs for permit. Okay. So oh, I sat. So there's I, a joke right there. I sat. I sat down at the uh, TMI Nick. at the lodge table, tied up a couple shrimps, and you know, next day I'm, the guide's like, Oh no, use this one, this one. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I want to use my fly. You know, right. you know, how adamant they are about, Oh yeah. want to use this fly or whatever. Right. Caught my first permit on that, on that fly that I tied oh. that night before at the lodge. I okay. thought, so I thought it was cool to have a little tying kit, you know, travel. No, absolutely. And, and whatnot. But. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, if I guess if I was going on a trip like that, I probably would. Might bring some stuff with you. Yeah. yeah I mean, I We're just going like, on a trip next year. If you're more than welcome to come. That'd be fun. All right. I get invited on trips all the time. I bet you do. And I'm scared of flying. So leave, make leave, you, leave your crabs at home. <laughs> leave my crabs at home, of Nick's course. Got, yeah. Nick's got plenty. So. Perfect. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> so um, th- I've, I've got all kinds of product questions because I use a lot of a lot of loon stuff. Um, so there's two. Like you, you guys have this fly tie and powder, right? Right. And... I tried to use it for the first time and I couldn't get it to cure, which I assume I used way too much. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what What's the ratio roughly? Or first of all, can we back up and maybe just talk about what what the heck that product is and why you would why you would use it? Because I don't even know if I was using the right application. Is that something you created? Um, it's not like well, it's an organic compound, mm-hmm. um, so it's minerals. So I didn't technically create it um, because it kind of came out of Mother the Earth. Mother Earth did. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I can't take credit there, but, uh, I, I manipulated it into a fly tying potion, if you will. Awesome. Um, it's actually really funny cause I, I'm kind of bummed, but, uh, we sold, it sold really well, but we ended up discontinuing it because mm. of your exact My point. reason. Yeah. Um, so like if you take the tip of your scissors and put like a ton of UV resin in that little cup. And you just drop that, like, you know, like, say, three stacks of quarters. Let's just put it into a, you know, visualization. Mm-hmm. You put just the tip of your scissors worth of resin. Mix it up, you're done. Well, it, it'll yeah, cure. I like, over-applied. Yeah. Big it's, time. Um, that was the kind of the other thing, like, why I think sales weren't that great. Because you use, it like, this. It forever. Dude, it would last until the uh, Ice Age. Well, that the was the smallest age. jar that we could, like, you know, it's this little round jar. Yeah. And it was like the smallest jar that we could like label and like make work. And it was like, wow, I have, I've had this for three and, years and I've yeah, never man. finished the and, bottle. Unless they <laughs> lose it crap. or there's a meteor strike. Yeah. That's the only way. Yeah. going to refresh that product. So it was actually okay. really funny. I was at a fly tying demo and I was demonstrating it. And this lady walks up and she puts her finger in it. She's just like what? <laughs> putting it on her eyelids. Yeah, she started putting it on her face for makeup, and I'm like, Damn. 
I was like, dude, we're in the wrong market. You oh, know, yeah. we need to we need to do something different here. And you can mix those together. Well, it's they're discontinued now, but I've got the primary colors, so I could theoretically mix them and make green and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're one of the first people that figured that out because I usually do like this like really ridiculous. Remember the color wheel in kindergarten? Yeah. Yellow and red yeah. makes blue. Blue and yellow <laughs> makes green, and people are like, like you can mix. You them. can. Yeah, that's pretty much you got the whole wheel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you if you have red, yellow, and blue, you're pretty you know, legit. Yeah, you know? that's cool. It's uh. And you do you guys still have the tungsten powder? Yeah. Do you do you guys sell a lot of that? I mean, are people really that crazy about check nymphing where they're gonna you know they need to change it like a? You know, it, it, it's in the, the, the check nymphing application is great. Mm -hmm. um, you can make really cool colored bodies and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but steelhead guys. Guys fishing bait fish patterns, because you can keel, you can put that resin anywhere, on that hook of the sh you know mm -hmm. hook shank. So if you're tying on like a you know like a weedless bass hook that seems to be really popular with fly tying mm -hmm. for bait fish patterns, instead of having it like be all the weight focused at the front like a traditional clouser where you're going up down up down up down up down and that's what's triggering, you can make it glide and mm. sink. So you can change your very cool. Yeah, you can change your your fulcrum of where the weight's distributed, so the fly behaves differently. With that tungsten powder. Yeah. Does so, it have the same curing issue, or if I use too much, it's not going to cure? You'd have to go pretty aggressive. Pretty. Okay. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I use it on a lot of my steelhead flies. Okay. Like, uh, like I'll coat bodies of low water flies. Like, say if they have like a, you know, I'm doing like a black something with a you know, like a yarn under, uh, not a yarn, but like a tinsel underbody. Mm -hmm. I'll coat that with tungsten and UV resin, like in a flow. You got to mix it a lot, but you don't get a lot of build, but you're adding just that little extra bit of weight because those uh, like traditional low water steelhead flies are, you can't uh, hide weights on them too much. Right. You know, you, mm. you can under wrap them with stuff, but I'm just reinforcing all the materials and adding weight. Mm-hmm. Then you have to mark, I don't know, it's a check nymph thing, but you have to like mark where all of your weighted ones are versus your heavies and your lights and your, <laughs> yeah, it gets, it gets weird. Okay. And then, so my last question on, on just fly tying material again, cause I'm a newbie, uh, the, what your wax, you guys have a high tack and a low tack wax. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. what, what are the, I mean, what are the differences other than I, I mean, I can you know, make the mental leap here and say one's more tacky than the other, but what's the situation you would use one in versus the other? It's really more of a personal preference. Okay. Some guys love real tacky wax. Um, I use the low tack personally. Um, I guess if you were trying to cram like a seven materials into a dubbing loop, you could really use the high tack just to get through all of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. It's, okay. it's just a personal preference, really. It's I I don't know which one yeah, even I, sells I more. I've got the high tack right now, but it's a little too sticky. Like I'm getting little pieces of, of material that I don't want on my hands stuck to my hands from it. So yeah. I'll probably get the low. That it would be it'd be a good option. I just spit my fingers. That's what I do. Works pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah. <laughs> if, yeah, I understand that being pretty much like I show up to like a demo and I have like pair of scissors and like a hackle flyer and guys are like oh yeah i think i got a dubbing spinner somewhere in here you know i forget everything so um or it falls out somewhere so like i'm like oh i'll just make do but yeah spit on stuff whatever whatever works out i was thinking about that in the kit that i was going to provide i'm like he doesn't need that he, he can he can figure it out because that was one of the things i was going to put a, a dubbing loop spinner in there i'm like ah if he needs to do it he can he can figure it he out he can do it out of dental floss <laughs> What uh you know what are some hacks like even for the OG tires out there you've been tying forever so what are what are some of your favorite hacks for for fly tying um, he you know Nick was telling me you've got your vacuum systems pretty cool you've got something to do with your foot no that was the old system oh you've upgraded no I've I've actually downgraded okay. I just went backwards um, I just have like a big uh, trash can under me and I just like sweep everything in there at the end I just don't even care anymore. Uh, it just got to a point where, I, I mean, it got to a point where I was just like making too much of a mess. And I'm like, eh, I'm over this. And I started clogging the vacuum. How many hooks have ended up in your kids' feet? Any? No, my kids are great. Good. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. They're, they're really good with flies. 
they both tie. So oh, I bet. I mean, course. you know, they're three and five. So um, we're working on the tickly caddis right now. That's that's the hot line this week. So I had a uh, I took a hole saw, and I flush mounted a funnel into the top of my desk. To the bottom of the funnel, I had the shop vac hose, and I had it hooked up to a momentary switch. So if you can imagine the rig going through, you know, the momentary switch is like your Christmas light switch. Oh, yeah. Okay. You click it on and off. Actually, I still use the switch for Loon Live. Um, it turns my my uh, fish tank, my swim tank, my fish skull fly tank tester on and off. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to, like, reach down and plug it in. I can just click, drop the fly in. There's the fly. Look, it wiggles, you know, <laughs> which is kind of what the tank tester does. It shows how the fly mm-hmm. swims and stuff. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I just, like, sweep all the materials in, turn it off, and push Boom. the button. Done. Go back to tying. Now, now my wife doesn't come in my office, and I'm not allowed anywhere else in the house. So we have, like, a happy medium. So I don't need the vacuum anymore. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Matt, I, um, you know, I, I, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, I, um, you know, I got into fly tying a couple, couple weeks ago, bought some used stuff from a buddy, and I've got a vice, and I don't remember the brand, but what vices, you know, if people are just starting out or someone's like been tying for a bit and they're ready to upgrade, you know, can you kind of like, what are some of your favorites at different price points? Well, that it's kind of a loaded question for me. And I mean, I, I'm sponsored by a vice company. Okay. Um, so like the top end of my, my vices is like my regal revolution. But I realize like a lot of guys may not want to spend five hundred dollars mm-hmm. on a vice. Very nice vice. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have they like the cool. you know, like I have the add ons, you know, like I have a custom base and it's another few hundred dollars and you know, toolbars and all this stuff. So and and I might have three of those. And unfortunately my kids might tie on those. But um when I mean when it comes down to it, it's it, it's really whatever you can afford. Like it's probably the best answer. Like a vice is going to last you forever. Like if it's a Dynaking, a very entry level Dynaking or an HMH or a Mongoose, most of those products are never going to die. You know, Peak. Um, it's it's. Yeah, I've got a Peak. I, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's a great vice. Um, the best thing to do is to go to a shop and check them all out. You know, and. To see which one you like the best, yeah. As exactly. far as ergonomics, and it's ergonomics, it's yeah. it's like a weird thing, but it's like the way it works with your hands, like your hand, like the the the, the feeling you have when you're working with the vice. Um, I love the cam lock, the cam lock, cam lock, right? And instead of the spring loaded jaws, I don't know why I've just always been right, been a fan of that. Right. Yeah. I see. I back in the day, I used to tie in a Dyna King, and I was like, yeah, this is great. But now if like I go back to a Dyna King, I'm like, wait, I have to adjust something because I'm so ADD with my tie. And it's like one second I'll be tying a 14 inch long rainbow trout streamer. And the next second I'm tying a size 14, like little yellow Sally. But that's just like, a, I'll be like, oh, cool. I'm over here now. It's, it's ADD for me. So there's so. no adjustments needed there. No, 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 absolutely not. Yeah. You just squeeze and go. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's but, pretty nice. Yeah, it, it's nice for production tying, too. Right. If you're working through, say, you're doing size sixes and eights and something, if you're tying a whole bunch of different sizes of the same bug, you just, you know, all your materials are, like you were talking about hacks. And it's like mm-hmm. prep all, you know, A, understand your vice, um, get the best one you can afford that your wife doesn't get mad at you or divorce you or girlfriend or whatever, you know, because uh, that always seems to be a question. My wife would never let me buy that. It's like. All right, you know, but it's a lifelong investment. So, right. you know, buy it once, you know, don't go and buy like a hundred dollar vice. And you're like, oh, a year later, you're like, oh, now I need rotary. Okay. So now I need a $400, you know, mm-hmm. oh wait, I want this one from like, that's handmade by this dude in like Europe. And there's only like 20 of them in the world. And now that's a $5,000 vice. Mm-hmm. It's like, just go for the one that the best one that you can afford and that you think will last you the longest. And you were talking about hacks. So like almost treating your fly like an assembly line. Is that what you were about to oh, say? Ab- like just a- absolutely you know, throwing, throwing your beads on all the hooks, getting them ready. And yeah. Like, like, you know, on the lower stack, we fish rubber legs mm-hmm. all the time. It's if you're, if I, you know, if I'm guiding the clients, like there's nine times out of 10, it's going to be a rubber legs on there. Right. Um, so I literally have 2,000 hooks that are size six rubber leg hooks. 
sitting in boxes on the on the bench. Um, everything gets bought in a big, as much as big of a portion as I can, and, and you should do that with any fly for your local water that you're going to be fishing anytime. Right. Um, right. But yeah, you know, say so your wrap, your lead wraps or non lead wraps, go on. Next goes on legs and antenna. Those, and then it goes. You get through like a hundred of those. You go to the next step, next step, next step, and that's that's the only way to tie a lot of flies quickly mm-hmm. is just repetitiveness. Right. Right. The assembly line stuff. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be jumping between like over to here to legs. And now it's just I need muscle to... memory. You yeah, know? exactly. Hmm. So that's a just a little secret, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, let's talk about Scott a little bit. I noticed on Instagram you made an announcement that you started repping for Scott. How's that going? What's your role there? So, yeah, I'm the Southwest rep for Scott. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, I make a, I make a good joke about most of the brands that I rep and they're either from California or originated in California. So Scott currently is in Montrose, Colorado. Um, it's an amazing brand. I mean, it was founded back in the day in San Francisco. I mean, post world war two, San Francisco was the epicenter of fly fishing, the golden gate angling and casting club. Um, just tons of history there. Right. Um, so working with, I mean, I still have rods from that era. I mean, old Scott F series glass, which they still make to this day. Um, we just launched the new G series, uh, which is the longest running production rod in the history of fly rods. Wow. So it, uh, I think it was like 73. Jim's going to beat me if I get my dates wrong on it, though. Uh, Jim's like our, our head our, our dude for Scott, he is like the designer, everything president. Um, so yeah, they, they came out like post World War II, 1973. They've got gra- you know, with fiberglass, jumped into graphite. And Scott was actually one of the first companies to ever do integral ferrules and also have a nine foot fly rod. Everything so, else was shorter, everything else was shorter. Everybody wow. was like, You're never gonna have a, ni- a nine foot fly rod. Now they're just keep getting longer and longer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my echoes are like ten six, right? And you put a competition thing on them, and they're like eleven something. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So um, there was a lot of innovation there, and there was a lot of you know just California history there. So I kind of like love all this like kind of California stuff. Loon's the anomaly. I can explain how everything else that I work with came from California except for Loon, <laughs> 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 because that is an Idaho company. So I can't I can't trick anybody there. Um, but yeah, no, just the history of the company, the, the roles that it's played, like in our North Coast steelhead fisheries, mm-hmm. um, you know, the the history of the company being at the Golden Gate Angling and Casting Club and just all this stuff. It's, it's just a really cool brand to work with. When a, a lot of our listeners do a lot of steelhead fishing and fish these valley rivers with like nine and a half foot, six weights, seven weights. What What's a rod that you would recommend for these guys listening to that you like, Scott? Anything in particular? Or it's hard, yeah. hard to pick one out of the lineup you know i mean i i mean i always put it back to uh i was everybody always asked me what's the rod i need and i was like man i have never been golfing with one club <laughs> <laughs> and the guy looks at me like partially like i'm an a-hole you know but then he's like that's a really interesting analogy but uh some of the rods so i i know what rods a lot of my my guide friends fish mm-hmm. and there's a lot of scott rods in the guide boats there's a um so there's there's a the radian mm-hmm. is pretty awesome it's it's an all-around killer stick for you know pretty much anything nine foot six weight if you want to go longer you can mm-hmm. um and a lot of guys that are looking for you know a little bit more budget conscious option are doing the flex the nine and a half foot six the nine and uh is is a really big standout especially I mean, let's face it, they're, they're big rivers. Mm-hmm. Typically, if you're walking, waiting, the lower sack, like when the flows drop in the wintertime, mm-hmm. you're still getting out pretty deep. Right. So that extra length, if you're on the Trinity, that extra length really plays into... Um, Just line management, line roll management, casting. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you're if you're trying to roll cast and you, you can get an extra foot up, you're able to hit that far seam, stack yeah, them yeah, into I mean, it, even, and get the drift. Even a foot and a half makes a big difference. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So... Um, those are pretty standout. You know, a lot of the a lot of the switch rods would be really fun too. Mm-hmm. You know, you were talking about like different stuff in fisheries. It's like I've swung full blown intruders, steelhead coastal intruders on the lower sack in the middle of winter and caught some trout. Mm-hmm. They were big trout. 
But they'll eat an intruder. And yeah. It's like, huh. Kind of goes back to the mousing question. Like, yeah, you can throw mice lots of weird places that you right. never think. Throw intruders lots of weird places that they might not think about throwing them. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be. I mean, if you're just talking single hand fishing, that'd probably be two of my top choices there. Cool. You know, if you wanted to have something a little bit more fun and retro, if you like a full flex rod, the G's pretty darn slick. Um, you know, it's just got a different tempo to it. Depends on where you're at with uh, your casting stroke. So medium fast, is that, what, is that what you would? Oh, for the G? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd put yeah. it as like a medium to medium fast. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's Power a, in the butt, softness in the tip. Yeah, yeah, you know, giggity. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's 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 honestly probably the closest. The new they, we had the G two, and now we have the new the new G series, mm-hmm. and it's probably the it, it has all the the heart and soul of the originals, which I collect and like covet in like a gun safe kind of scenario. Um, has a lot of the heart and soul there, but it it throws a flatter loop, so it's it's a cool dry fly rod, especially if you get into like some of the really niche dry fly fishing we have on the lower sack, which, you know, a lot of people just think of burning bobbers into your retinas out there. And, <laughs> um, not really the case that has to happen. <laughs> you know, there's a, there, there, there's life outside the bobber. It's a, yeah. Nick showed us, showed me a little bit of it last time we went out. So the swing, I've, I've seen it now, the dry fly. Oh so, yeah. I mean, the, it. the, it's a great swing fishery on soft tackles. Like I've been fishing soft tackles since April exclusively, nothing else, just soft tackles. So just for, uh, my education, so, soft tackles. Yeah. So it's basically a nymph with a, like a collar or a hackle around the head of it. So no bead on it. And no, you, you can use a you bead, bead if you want. Yeah. yeah. But the main thing, it's supposed to imitate <coughs> like an emerger. So okay. You have the nymphs that are down 90% of the time, right? Yep. Rolling around on the rocks. And when they hatch, they're coming up to the and surface as a Somewhere dry. in the mod- water column. That soft between. tackle is supposed to be the, the mid, you know, mid-level. mid And then what's a rig look like for that? It's, I mean, it's just like a steelhead rig. Oh, I mean, it's just... You just swing it. Yeah, I mean, you could you could throw it on a tapered leader if you wanted to. Okay. Um, I throw mine on like a poly leader, intermediate poly leader on like a four-weight trout spay. Mm-hmm. And just go swing gravel bars. At the end of the day, there's some locals here that love that. That's all they do. They'll go out to the sack out of Red Bluff. And but you get a grab like a steelhead and yeah. on a swing. But yep. if you hook a 26 inch sack rainbow yeah. on a four inch trout spay, I'd have a hard time differentiating that between steelheading with like you know seven or an eight weight. So you're the the four weight trout spay. That's the its butt section that was like a six. Yeah. Is it similar to how Echo does their their nymph rods? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty new. It's it's a full flexing piece of equipment. I mean, that's cool. You're you're getting Sounds a run fun. for your money. I think swinging. A, a, just hearing stories over the past, swinging brings up some of the biggest the biggest fish I've ever caught on the Yuba was swinging a, a fly. Hmm. You know, swinging it up across. The, Maybe after I get bored with check nymph, you don't start doing that next time. Same water. Yep. Yeah. Same. You can do it in the same water, and um, you know, and and I think it's really just it's a different thing. It's like. They see like this thing go by, you know, and the next one goes by in this lateral line and it's like everybody's on the same six to eight feet of water. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you like swing something through and it's like, oh, what's that? it's just moving yeah. and it has like its own, uh, you know, its own motion to it. And yeah, because those like, fibers are just going to softly kind of yeah. float in there too around the body. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing holding it down. There's nothing, there's nothing holding it back. It's kind of at the mercy of the current, which is mm-hmm. the most like... An emerging That's what insect. I like about check nymphing also. Right. So, yeah. That the, look you just did when you're looking up like a like a fish would look up to the it was exactly <laughs> the same picture in your Instagram. what's the story behind that chicken in or that little uh oh, chicken a, in your Instagram photo? That, that's the loon. Uh, so I got <laughs> <It's> bo- <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's I, a rubber ducky. Man. I just I just got super bored one day <laughs> and uh I uh I tied this like loon logo out of deer hair oh that's tight you tied that yeah what yeah that's actually wow. that's actually a deer hair Dude, yeah wow we gotta we gotta make this challenge a little bit more than what we have yeah i know that's all right dude's, um, gonna, dude's gonna tie a train or something <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so like i i think i had that and i think it was like in the early days of loon live so they asked me if like the webcam was working or something so i like was being a smart ass and uh, I like took this picture, like, because I had this huge, ridiculous mustache, which I'm working on growing back right now. And uh, 
You're you know, going to have like, to get, you rolled up in a, I don't know what that is, but it's not a van out, and out you're going to have to get a van. Yeah. Uh, well, Keep that my wife shot the van idea down. It was kind of disappointing. Oh, you've ran that fire? Yeah. A couple, <laughs> like five times. It doesn't go any better in, the more you ask, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I just kind of shot this goofy photo with that. So that's. That's great. No, I mean, don't change it. It's awesome. It's just my, good. my previous one was like a kitten with laser beam eyes. So <laughs> I like find these like horribly weird pictures and just. Chad's, it, Chad's looking it up right now so you can just, see what the hell we're talking about. Yeah, I just yeah, put, I always I just, wondered what the hell that was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mystery solved. <laughs> just some deer hair belly turned into a loon. No big deal. No biggie. So what, what's, uh, tell me about Able Automatics. That's a brand that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, so Able is, uh, it's a pretty cool company. They started out of, you know, the LA area. We'll just make it really simple. They're, uh, you know, in Camarillo and Steve Abel started the company, I think in the eighties. So like kind of around when I was born, um, I think it was like the later eighties, but some of the first like really cool big game reels with mm-hmm. like killer cork drags. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, that's and, why and almost ahead of his time with like designing those reels and yeah, the colors and that's why I don't know about it. Cause I don't, I haven't done any saltwater stuff yet. Right. Right. Um, okay. so, you know, he made vices, he made travel luggage. So he was like, pimping out dudes with like sick travel luggage like back in the day before sims was doing sick travel luggage Mm -hmm. and rod tubes i mean all this stuff but what they're known for is just hands down the best of anodizing processes Mm -hmm. i mean if if i showed you a reel i'd be like oh yeah this part this is machined here this is machined by able this is machined by it's like everything you're like they just machine everything and it's like, yeah. And then they use special, uh, we use a special blend of uh, aluminum, which is a 7075 T651. So it's like, guess. What was it's it harder like? than the 60, it, it's, 60. It, yeah, it's, it's like a, yeah, it's above 6061. Yeah. So, oh God, is which is a, most of our fly reels. There's another thing I need to know about fly fishing. What oh. the hell are you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, most, most of your like machined fly reels are going to be a 6061 aluminum. It's like a, it's kind of is that like comes down to the is that the density of the material soft or? house yep yeah okay. how soft yeah how hard it is and okay. so weight. so the seventy seventy five t six fifty one is a cut above you have to order it special you know Abel has their own spe- it's like KFC they have their own special blend of herbs and spices mm-hmm. of metals that go into it you know there's mm-hmm. a lot of x amount of this metal this metal it's not just aluminum at the end of the day um, so they're all machined. Then they go into a basic tumbler, mm-hmm. which, you know, every reel will go into a tumbler. After that, they go to a dude's hands and they're all hand polished and then they're hand finished one at a time. Wow. So we have some reels with graphics where, um, I mean, the guy is spending over eight hours just doing a graphics process on it. And uh, we've contracted with tons of really cool, like, uh, fly fishing artists like Derek DeYoung, Andrea Larco, like all these cool guys that do really amazing work. So you have these cool series that yeah, you guys do. Right. That's cool. Um, you know, you can buy an Able Reel in plain black. That's how they come. That's like the base model. But the real thing that's awesome with Able is like, cool. So I fish a, you know, say it's a Scott Meridian and the highlights on that rod are blue and green and it's a gray blank. So, oh, okay, I'm going to get my Able to be slate gray with a black this because it matches this real seat. And then I'm going to have a blue knob over here and a lime green this over here. And it's like you can customize it. Like a Barbie doll. Yeah, it's like... You can accessorize it. Yeah, you can accessorize the reel. Yeah. I mean, I would have picked something more manly. But, uh... <laughs> well, I often I often refer to it a, to an AR as a Barbie doll, the lower, because you can pretty much build it up for however you want. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Able's kind of the same way. Um, and they recently moved their facility to Montrose, Colorado as well. So it's kind of cool. All, a lot of my Ross, Abel and Scott are all in Montrose. So it's a, it's a pretty cool trifecta. It saves me a lot on airfare, (laughs) you know? Um, but you know, Abel started in Cali, their anodizing process is still here in California. Uh, Ross, a lot of people think of, they say Ross and it's like, Oh, it's Colorado company. And little known fact is yeah, that in, they've been in California. Yeah, they started in Etna. Yeah, he got ran. Ross Hawk got ran out of Etna 
because they didn't want big business in Aetna. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, great. I have this manufacturing facility where we're going to machine aerospace parts and fly reels. And I'll have jobs for, like, yeah. all Jeez. these people. Yeah, get out of here, buddy. <laughs> Jeez. You know? We don't need your kind. We don't need your thinking around here. <laughs> <laughs> but no, actually, I have friends in that, and they'll probably punch me next time they see me. <laughs> so, do you ever see the industry going from um, just basically your your computer screen designing a reel, designing a rod, and then having it show up at your doorstep? E commerce, basically, from basically like one offs. It's already there. Nike ID. Kind Able of does stuff. it. They do. Oh. Yeah, you can go. You can go on Able's website, and you can pick. Your spool color, your I mean, basically everything. Um, but they're not selling it to you. You have to pick a store. Right. You have to pick a friend. Right. Because... Pay the tariff. Well, no. I mean, just, uh, you know, go back to the shop. Brick and mortar. Mm-hmm. Right. So a lot, of, a lot of the companies that I work with also only deal with brick and mortar. Hmm. You know, because uh, it, that's the most important thing. I would, I would hate to see the industry honestly go... It keeps you out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, you know, I, I don't think I would be where I'm at if there, we didn't have the brick and mortar stuff in terms of where I'm at skill wise now, just because that's half the part of fly fishing is being able to go in and talk to these people that are in there every day working, you know, right. Right. And, and you learn. And when you walk in there, it's worth the drive down to the shops. So yeah, a lot. A- absolutely. I can't, I can't say that enough. Um, you know, I think like right now we're at this great crossroads where there's, a ton of young people and they're very technically savvy Mm -hmm. and you know, I I don't go to a tying demo and have a bunch of 20 year old kids there. It's not the scene. It's like that dude watches a YouTube video at home. He learned, okay, cool, cool, cool. I need this, this and this. And he like probably, I've seen him like, you see him like stealth into a shop (laughs) and they're like, (laughs) and like, like, you know, the old guy's like, Hey, what are you doing over there? You need some help. And he's like, no, I got it. (laughs) You know, and he's like walks up the counter and he's gone. Mm-hmm. And he's like, cool, I got my stuff. I got to go home. Like, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, the, 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 the older crowd shows up and, you know, they got their coffee and like, you know, like we're going to do this uh, live stream where you make me tie a fly. It's like, I have like five GoPros around me. I'm like, how do you guys even know how to operate a GoPro? <laughs> like, I'm impressed, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I really, I really like that feature. You know, I really like shops. Um, you, you know, we were talking about the Stoke of uh you know new stuff and like seeing new product when i you know brought my my all my new stuff into the you know fish first and you know somebody asked me why fly fishing stuck with me and it was like the one thing i remember of being a kid it's like cool you're driving up going to the eastern sierra to go fish this like this huge area and it's like seems limitless like wow i've got five hours of driving and there's trout streams every 15 miles this is gonna be sick and, like, you pull into town late at night, you sleep wherever you find a place to sleep. You know, as a kid, you just can't rent hotels. So what do you do? You go find a dirt road and sleep on the side of the road or your car. Mm-hmm. And you, like, roll in the fly shop and you're pumped. And that dude, like, m- maybe at the end of the day, he's fed you the biggest line of BS ever. But when you leave there, you've got this, like, box of magic things. Like, it's, like, cool. Magic beans. These are going to make bean stalks and bean stalks are fish. Mm-hmm. Like... Then you like, there's like this, this like whimsical magic behind like fly shops and getting to your, close to your destination. And it's like, yeah, the anticipation of it all yeah. is half the, yeah. the draw. And know? like, you know, in your head, you're like, I was here last year and I know he's going to show me that fly. And he like blows your mind somehow. And it's like, dude, this is the new one. And you're like, <laughs> crap, I don't, I didn't have any of those. I have to buy them all, you know, or that you <laughs> see like one. a new rod or a line or an indicator. I mean, it's, it's just kind of the fun part of it. Yeah. You know? It's that tactical, or, you know, not tactical. Um, it's just that tacti- tactile feel of, like, being there, touching something, getting it. You know, I think that's a huge part of... People ask me all the time, where do I get some materials online? I'm like, you just go to a fly shop. You got to yeah. be able to look at it, look at the package, see what's there, you know? And, I mean, and picking the... The one package of hackle is, I mean, going to be different from the other one, you know. And so you kind of yeah. Gotta, well, I, you know, I here's a here's a case in point. This happened today. I go on a fish first, and I buy zonker material. Right. And so I started pulling it down, and Jason's there, and he's like, "What are you going to be using it for?" So I described it, and he's like, "Oh, you don't want that zonker stuff because you want cross cut." Yes, cross cut. Like I was yeah. grabbing cross cuts. Right. He's like, "No, no, no, you don't <laughs> want cross cuts for what you're going to be doing." And I would have not known that if I bought that online. I would have just had a shit ton of cross cut stuff <laughs> sitting there and not being used. 
Well, no, Whatever. and and that's the thing. Um, you know, guys ask me all the time, like same question, dude. Where do I get materials online? And I'm like, I wouldn't buy a material online. Mm-hmm. They're like, dude, you have all these like all these all these materials. It's like, yeah, they're all hand picked. <laughs> Because if I'm tying a bunny leech and I'm going to be throwing it on a like a five or a six weight, like say a switch or like a light spay, I want that height. I want that height on that bunny to be so thin. Right. Because I don't want it to absorb water. Right. Now, if I'm going to throw it on an eight weight, I'm going to be way less picky. Hmm. But also, if I'm the dude at the fly shop and I like see a guy who's like, oh, I just ordered some guinea. Hmm. I'm going to need some guinea later this week. I'll go through like all the bags. And I'm like, huh, that's for him. Well, that one's a gem. That one, put it at the back and like hide it. Like, yeah, that's about the way that worked out. So, you know, there, th- that's, the, that's the thing, you know, you go in there and it's yeah. like, if, like you're, if you're taking the time, like well, you should pick your own stuff. People that are into, you know, clothes, they buy a lot of, people buy a lot of clothes. There's, they have this term, the hand, like how, how it feels on your yeah. hands. Like if you're, you're buying material to, to right. sew. It's the same thing. You go in a fly shop, I think it's probably much the same sort of thing. You need that tactile kind of experience to really close the loop on, you know, whatever plan you have, strategy you have for that that particular tie. Yeah, you could look at a material online and you're like touch you're like visually thinking about how it's gonna like melt onto this fly and it's gonna be yeah. the best thing ever. And you like get to the store and you touch it and you're like, that's totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that's you, ne- that's never gonna work. Earlier you mentioned some kind of custom uh tools that were around your vice, like the, um, the plate that you had that you're using. And is there any little indie companies that are coming out, like cool products that you like that you want to like, you had the flywheel on, I think you posted the flywheel on, on the gram at one point, you know, that, you know, yeah. what I'm talking about the, yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, uh, I love the flywheel. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's great for me for like production time. Cause I'll have like beads, hooks, everything's like right there. Magnetic top, like, finished products yeah, or it's sta- really cool stages go in a certain spot um and yeah those guys just came out of nowhere like they like contacted me and they were like hey do you want to check out a tie wheel i was like can't promise you anything that I'm, like i can't promise you that i'm gonna give you a glowing endorsement or I love this <laughs> and, like i got it home and i put it on and like it was all oh this is cool it's like modular it's like legos or it's mm-hmm. like an ar mm-hmm. for like tying and it's all the, every component's magnetized, so you can just pop it off and put a different one on. Yep, it's pretty cool. It's like a picture, like a pizza with a bunch of wedges, and then each piece of slice has a different thing you can right. put in it. Right, and it's all connected with magnets. It's cool. I, I do have a vice problem, so there's lots of vices at my house. So, you know, I have like it's on one of my my tying stations. <laughs> we we go into multiple stations of tying at in the office. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Um, what about, uh, like Instagram, do you like, uh, some fly tires on Instagram or YouTube that, that you like to like promote ones that or people that should you follow like watching the ones that are doing some cool stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like as far as like just learning and technique and stuff like that, um, fly fish food is he's on YouTube. Uh, it's Cheech and Curtis. They work with us at loon. They're on our ambassadors. Um, And they're just funny guys, but they do cool videos and they, they're just hilarious. Like they do great stuff. Um, as far as Instagram, you you should probably follow, uh, like two, three, nine flies. Um, he's a guy, uh, he's another friend and he's out of, uh, Southern Florida, like right where Irma's going. So we were talking the other day and he's like, like, what are you up to? Are you going to be okay? He's like, my family's flying to Colorado. Um, expletive, expletives, you know, shenanigans, talks about guns, drugs, smoking. The guy's like a fireman. And he's like, yeah, when I'm smoking my cool menthols, you know, I'll be here <laughs> waiting for Irma. And you're like, Nick, you're a fireman and you're probably one of the most physically fit specimens I've ever seen. You know, the guy looks like a gorilla, like he's so strong. Um, but he does really cool saltwater tying videos. Um, and if you don't mind bad language, drug references and other such <laughs> like, but, it, but if you know him, you know, it's a joke. Yeah. Like it, it's right. just a front. Um, another guy is, uh, Ebbs force one is Matt Evers. Yeah, and I follow him. He's, he's wicked good with like nymphs and streamers and stuff like that. Um, you know, you can't go wrong with guys like Blaine chocolate and Greg Senyo. Um, they, they have a ton of cool content out there as well. Not to mention like some of the cooler materials these days. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like a big synthetic revolution. I was right just going to ask you about that. Yeah, 
yeah. synthetics, just synthetics in general. Yeah, it's. Uh, what do you mean by revolution? It's 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 just a, you know, the steelhead tire in me. Right. Like it's like so traditional and super yeah. traditional. Like right. I have feathers that are two hundred dollars a piece. Um, some that are more, you know, like these $500 bird pelts so I can dye them and tie steelhead flies. But, um, the synthetic stuff is getting, it's like technology. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, this is getting exponentially better faster. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of cool synthetic materials coming out that you can get to do things that naturals were doing, but your bonuses is they don't absorb water. They're synthetic. They're cheap. There's no importation laws against them. So it's like available mm-hmm. to the masses. Like I'd feel like a jerk if I like showed up to a, an, an event to do a tying demo and like I brought like all of my, my coveted box of rarities, you know? And like I'm like, oh yeah, you need a, uh, a macaw, you know, you need macaw because that's super common in flies we're going to do a hair wing with a monkey skin you know like because you got one of those lying around right you know and uh you know this is uh you know whatever this is seals fur that's been legally obtained it's right. like yeah. nobody's selling seals fur anymore you know um what about cdc i love cdc and i don't use it on dry flies really i i mean every once in a while I'll, like throw a little bit in there it's yeah. like a yeah, some CDC. It's a great soft tackle application. One of the w- biggest trout I've ever caught on a fly was with a CDC tied. Yeah, nymph. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, uh, I think ninety percent of my like lower sack bugs have a little corporation of some CDC. So CDC is some sort of a material off of a bird. It's, I it's take it. Called it's, a canard. Yeah, it's basically the feathers from the duck's derriere. Is <laughs> how most people describe it. It's from like a certain spot on the duck, I guess. Um, I've never actually looked into it, so somebody just described it as such to me. And it's I was basically like, duck pubes is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they're super curly and stuff. Okay. <laughs> no, they're pretty neat. When you drop them under the water, it actually will hold the like air bubbles. Oh. But then when it gets wet, it just has a lot of great movement into it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you're tying caddis patterns, like even if you're just using it as legs, like it looks cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen like these guys are tying nymph legs with, I think, I think it's the bottom of the of the uh, feather when you like pull it off the. Oh, it's pheasant tail. So you you, uh, you strip the pheasant tails mm-hmm. off the center, and you, if you strip them right, they get that curve. Yeah. So when you tie them in, it looks like they have. They look like little feet. Yeah. Yeah. Fish fish totally care about that. <laughs> <laughs> they can count too. So if you put an odd number on, they'll never eat the fly. Well, that's <laughs> it's sad, but that's where I've gone in my tying. I, I do less is more. Right. right, very simple patterns that are going to take me very little time to tie, and they're going to catch fish, or at least I, I think they will, and most of the time they do. But oh yeah, yeah. there it, it, there seems to be two different types of tires on YouTube. One I consider to be the artisan that they're they're making the fly really to look good for people. Right, and then there's another group of tires that are you know very practical. You know this thing is going to actually it's quick to tie and it looks good enough to get fish. Yep, absolutely. Is that basically the two camps? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, you know, it's funny, the Euro guys, all the Euro nymph dudes, they're way more utilitarian. It's like yeah. heavy, 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 flash That's why I like material. <laughs> tie, <laughs> done. <laughs> Throw some resin on it. Yeah, <laughs> done. Um, and I, I go with I go back and forth with Hogan on this. I give him a hard time. I'm like, yeah, I did good, did good today. And like, I'll post some pictures, and it's like a thread pattern with, like, one little wrap of dubbing. And I'm like, that's what I fished on the lower today. 32 fish. He's like, I hate you. That's not even a fly. <laughs> like, it worked. And he's like, that's not a fly. You didn't even tie a fly today. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it just really depends on what you want to do. Yeah. Um, I've done, like, the same thing. Like, you're like, oh, less is more. So I've tied, like, the artisan elaborate PMD pattern. It's got CDC and you know, all these different materials and layers of colors. And it looks like it, you could see like it's heart inside there beating as it, you know, <laughs> and it's like, that's awesome. And you take like 80% of that stuff away and you put like a CDC collar and some yellow yeah. brown blah. Yeah. And you're like, thwink, thwink. I'll fish the other one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's I've, like, I've seen huh. some, some nymph patterns with UV resin and the guy like takes red thread and runs it just one piece through the 
length of the thorax, so it looks like a little blood, yeah. little bloodline. Like, yeah, 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 it's no. a little. It's a little I, I always tell people, I'm like, trout don't count, and they don't go to school. So people are like, wait, what? <laughs> no, there's only five legs on there. Yeah, trout don't count, dude. I guarantee it. Yeah, Miller, Miller, on a couple episodes ago, when we were talking to the guys at the at the Reading Fly Shop, he said, uh, I just want to make a ball of yarn, something the cattle slap, you know, right. whack. Absolutely. Yeah, you just got to get them to f- try to figure out what it is. Yeah. Suggestiveness. Hmm. It's a huge key. I like that. Yeah. Same same thing. It's just be suggestive. Well, Matt, thanks a lot for coming in, man. We really appreciate your time today. I know we uh, we ran this episode longer than normal, <laughs> but I think it was worth it. There was a lot of information to get out. Um, so before we before we cut you loose, yeah. Um, where can everybody find you guys online? Loon, all, all the brands you rep, your own inst- Instagram, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so Loon, uh, like the Loon Live gig is just loonoutdoors.com forward slash Loon Live. Um, and like I said, that's the first and third Thursday of every month. You can actually just go to our website and it takes you where mm-hmm. you need to go. Um, you know, Scott's pretty simple. It's scottflyrod.com, Echo, you know, everything. Everything's pretty self-explanatory mm-hmm. there. Um, my Instagram is uh, socalis23, as everybody calls me. When I moved up north, I was Khalees <laughs> from Southern California. So they're like, socalis, when's your birthday? I was like, well, it's the 20th. You're 23. Oh, uh, okay. I, <laughs> so I always was, wondered. I was okay. 23 when I moved up here, and I was from San Diego. That's so funny. it was kind of like my weird random nickname that I obtained. Sweet. Yeah. All right, well, thanks again. Thanks, Thanks, guys. guys. Thanks for listening. We'll get, get on the next episode. Rip it. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Build. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vien Chen Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.bill.